maybe if we started with a little bit of perspective on the so I loved your bit at the end about you know not being a huge fan of big pharma. So uh, I, I, I'd love to, you know, because most of my audience is, is is pharma guys who I think are probably the more thoughtful end of the of the pharma spectrum, instead of the uh, um, the, the hucksters. So it'd be great to uh, you know uh, hear your origin story and a little bit more about that, and then go through the chapters so sort of one by one if, if that's okay. Um, yeah, I you know I. In the introduction to the book, I um, mentioned uh, that I didn't have any axes to grind in terms of the uh, the debate over the industry. The farm industry has gotten such a to be such a political issue. It's a lot of um, anti farm feeling out there in the public, and and uh, my goal as a science writer was to try and and uh, sidestep that to a certain extent go in as objectively as I could and uh, and take a look at the history of the development of the industry without getting mired in uh, any particular agenda one way or another. So um, that was my goal at the beginning. And then as, as you mentioned at the end of the book, by the time I got to the end of the book, after I'd um, examined some of the more recent uh, uh, pharmaceutical success stories, um, you know, the last uh, 30, 30 years or so, including the statins and the antipsychotics and and the ways in which those drugs were uh, not only developed, but also marketed. Um, I uh, admitted at the end of the book that, in fact, I had come to believe that there were some things that the industry could do better. There were some ways that uh, I thought the um, that the for-profit motive in the industry um, had the ability, and, and there is some evidence that it has skewed priorities within the industry uh, toward, you know, in ways that make sense for corporations, uh, for for-profit corporations exist to make money for their shareholders. That's a given, and, and I'm not averse to that. I think that that's uh, what a corporation is there to do, and and Pharmaceutical corporations are often excellent at returning uh, uh, income to their shareholders, and and um, that's fine. I think for you know that that is uh, just an example of how good pharma can be at what they do. On the other hand, in uh, that same uh, profit motive, can skew uh, drug development toward. I think classes of drugs and types of drugs that tend to return more profit on the investment in R&D. So if you are putting a ton of money into R&D, you want to get that money back out. It makes sense. And you want to do that as efficiently and effectively as possible. Certain kinds of drugs give you a better return on investment than others. And so it's natural that there would be a skew in the, in the development process toward those things that give you a better return. Um, and again, that's just the nature of the beast. Um, however, it does have an effect on the kind of drugs that are available, and in particular on the way those drugs are marketed and sold to the public. And those things are problematic. There are pro there are potential problems. I think people within the industry would recognize that there are potential issues there, um, as well as members of the public. That said, I will add that I think that much of the criticism of uh, big pharma that you see, especially in political circles, is uh, not terrifically well-founded in fact, and, and is often uh, motivated for other reasons. You know, is that uh, people want a fall guy, they want, they want a bad guy that they can attack. Pharma makes an easy bad guy, and so they get a lot of, you know, they get a lot of, uh, of uh, low blows as well. Uh, so anyway, it's a complex issue, but, my attitude as I as I went through the book uh, changed a little bit, and it changed in that way. Uh, and um, you know, I, I think that we have to accept. You, you know, I think you write at the end of the book. You know, everyone hates big pharma, and I think that it has been a political puppet. I think that the the challenge I see from inside is that there is no average pharma company, right? There's the, there are the you know, you know the opioid folks. There is the, you know, there's the price gougers, and then there's the kind of you know the dedicated, uh, you know, research scientists and the um, and and the and the game of 
um, you know, how hard it is to discover and develop a, a, a drug at the same time. So, um, no, I mean, so I, I, I watched that journey and certainly you're, we'll come to the chapter on the kind of statins uh, as well, which I thought was a very interesting and personal uh, sort of journey for you uh, through that chapter. But I mean, maybe let's, let's go back to the beginning. So, you know, your um, impetus for writing the book was clearly a, you know, a, 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 a trip and a journey. You mentioned you're a, you're a science writer. So, you know, maybe a little bit of perspective on you and, how you came to write the how you came to write the book? Sure, um, my uh, background uh, was in immunology and microbiology. I originally uh, had intended to be a research scientist and went through graduate work in uh, the med sort of medical science, medical microbiology and immunology, and and uh, then decided about uh, just short of my of my doctorate that I didn't really enjoy working in laboratories, I found laboratory work uh, didn't suit my personality. My personality tends, I, I tend to be interested in a lot of things. And, and uh, so for me, lab work was a little too narrow and uh, uh, kind of focused on the next big grant kind of thing. So I dropped out of uh, research science, decided to write about science instead. That turned out to be a good match for me. So I've written, uh, um, about a dozen books, uh, some in the medical field, some in uh, pure science, chemistry, uh, one book on engineering, and uh, have uh, used those skills that I learned in graduate school in, you know, studying uh, science at a fairly sophisticated level, used those skills and brought them into writing. Uh, what I'm trying to do with my writing is not write uh, books for people necessarily who are uh, already well versed in the sciences. What I try and do with my books is to draw people in who don't know much about science and to get them excited about what science can do for them and has done for our society. I find, uh, I find it astounding when I talk to groups of people uh, how little understanding there is about the history of how we got to where we are in our society. You know, I'm looking, we're communicating over Zoom. I'm looking at your office. It's full of, of uh, technological and musical uh, devices. My office is uh, packed with technology as well. The lights we turn on, the air conditioning that we enjoy, all of this stuff uh, has a history. It's all stuff that our great, great grandparents didn't have. Life was very different through most of human history until very recently. And the technological revolution the science technology revolution of the last, uh, say, century and a half, two centuries, has just brought phenomenal changes to human culture. People just don't appreciate that. You know, in, in college, people study art history and they study, uh, uh, you know, political history, economic history. It, most people never study science history, and science is just as important in our lives, maybe more important than any of those. Uh, other things. So I um, have devoted myself to bringing people into uh, understanding how science and technology have affected our culture and our society, how they affect our daily lives. And I want to do that in a way that doesn't scare off general readers. So my stuff is, is geared toward general readers. You don't have to know a lot of science to come into it, but you learn a lot of science, I hope, by the time you come out of it. It's science at a, I try and be as accurate as I can be, but I also try and write at a level that will not scare general readers off. And a lot of science books uh, are written by people who know a lot about science, but, but you know, they often steep their, uh, their presentations in so much data and um, uh, in mathematical equations and stuff that might scare off general readers. Uh, who don't know much about science. I try and open it up. So I tell stories. I'm a storyteller. You saw in the drug book. I, you know, there's a series of short stories, really short story about the development of individual drugs or classes of drugs. Um, and my other books have been narrative as well. They're, they tell, I find human stories to tie the science to. That brings in uh, more general readers. So that's kind of my approach. Yeah. And, um, you know, if I, if I was thinking through parallels, for you know what I read in in, in ten drugs, I, I was I was thinking of 
Bill Bryson, of Henry Petrosky and the kind of, you know, the design uh, world. I absolutely um, learned a lot that I didn't know about the pharmaceutical industry. And I think that the approach of writing, as you say, short stories was, was illuminating. The thing that struck me time and time again was how much uh, today is like a hundred years ago, and, and and I guess you know you wrote this pre-pandemic, but the uh, you know the story of you know uh, inoculation, the story of uh, demonization of the Chinese, and so forth, you know, so so many parallels, you know, from from one hundred years ago, echoing today. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, you know, I will say that uh, you're right. I, I finished this book just before the pandemic. Well, you know, in the year before the pandemic, and. Um, had I, if I was writing the book now, I would include um, a drug that absolutely fascinates me right now that is tied into the pandemic response, and and that's hydroxychloroquine. But you know, this is the drug that President Trump and uh, President Bolsonaro of Brazil and, and a number of other political figures have gotten behind hydroxychloroquine as a, you know supposedly a big deal in terms of fighting um, COVID nineteen and. And that story uh, really is fascinating because of that interplay of how little we know about the, the science of hydroxychloroquine versus COVID-19. We've learned a lot in the last few months, but um, really we are still just scratching the surface of what the drug might or might not actually do, but it doesn't look like it does much. So there's that on the science side, but on the political side, the thing has just gone nuts, as you know. and and. Uh, uh, that interplay between politics and science fascinates me, you know. Um, so I've been tracking uh, a lot of uh, very, very um, fervent believers in hydroxychloroquine, yeah. Yeah. whose belief is based not on evidence, but rather on sort of a, a mixture of hope and, and sort of political persuasion. Um, and yet they are so committed in the, in the absence of evidence, they're so committed to their thesis about how the drug works. It's just amazing to me. There's that whole side of drug development that's really about belief systems rather than evidence, you know? Hmm. And so that, that, you know, if I was doing the book now, I would definitely include uh, hydroxychloroquine. I bet. All right. Well, that would be an interesting uh, um, sort of follow, follow up or supplement because I think you're exactly right. I mean, I'm watching this and saying, look, you know, is there, is there a truth about hydroxychloroquine? But everyone is seeing it through a lens of wanting it to work, wanting it to not work, you know, and um, uh, almost yeah. because of their priors rather than because they're open to, 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 to being persuaded. Um, really is very, very, very interesting. But, and, 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 you know, and, and that theme, I think you say in the, in the kind of beginning of the book, you know, a lot of the history of drugs is rooted in error accidents and lucky breaks. I think that, uh, you know, I particularly enjoyed that kind of view of serendipity as a part of, uh, of, of, of how we got to now within the, within the process. So, um, I mean, maybe, uh, let, let, let's step through sort of chapter by chapter. So, you know, the, sort of chapter one, the, the, the joy plant, um, you know, this discovery of, uh, I mean, essentially, you know, opium, uh, you know, and, and, and then subsequent chapters come back to that. Um, you can tell us about the, you know, the, I guess the story of the opium chapter. Sure. Sure. You know, I, um, I think that opium and, and the uh, derivatives from the opium, from the poppy, uh, from opium poppies, uh, were uh, probably that family, uh, the opiates and uh, opioids, that family of drugs, I think, typifies more about the history of drug development than any other group of uh, the class of drugs, uh, both because of the longevity of, of human interaction with those drugs. You know, uh, we've been using, um, there's evidence of the use of poppy derivatives, uh, going back to the rise of the first cities uh, 10,000 years ago, practically. Uh, as long as there's been civilization, we've, we've dealt with um, opium and opi opiates. And, uh, and that development of that class of drugs has uh, typifies a lot about the uh, power that organic chemistry and uh, the development of the chemical sciences have brought 
to the study and development of drugs as well. So I, I spent three chapters in the book. Most, most of the drugs in the book get a chapter each. You know, the classes of drugs get one chapter. Uh, opiates, I spread across three chapters because uh, it's such a big part of the story of the development of pharmaceuticals um, and their interplay with human society. So uh, the first chapter, the joy plant, talks about the discovery, uh, you know, hypothesizes about some methods by which humans might have first come in contact uh, with these drugs, and then about their early development and their, um, you know, the search, uh, the beginning of the search for the essence of the poppy plant. People knew that poppy sap, opium, raw opium had these marvelous qualities. It was a, it was a terrific painkiller. It brought a sense of euphoria, and um, that's why they called it the joy plant. And, uh, and People were aware of this uh, when opium was in its raw state, but early chemists wanted to get to the uh, spirit, you know, the essence of the opium plant. What was it that gave uh, this sap, this poppy sap, its power? And uh, that whole search was tied into um, alchemy and the early uh, development of organic chemistry where you're separating natural substances into their constituents and studying the constituents to find out which one carry, you know, which one's the powerful bit. And this is where we began to tear apart and, and find um, all the constituents, you know, codeine and thebane and all of these uh, uh, yeah. pieces yeah. that uh, there, there are dozens of components in opium that help give it its power. But we were uh, found the, the main ones and the big one was the discovery of morphine. And so another, another chapter sort of follows that morphine line. Uh, morphine is the most powerful of the, of the individual components in opium. And you take morphine and you start to play with morphine molecules and that leads to a whole uh, group of opiates. And we talk about, uh, I talk about the development of heroin and so forth in subsequent chapters. Those three chapters to me are critical. So anyway, uh, I, found, I found the opiates just fascinating. Then it gets into the whole political history and I'm covering three chapters here instead of one, sorry. But you know, as I follow that thread through, you're talking about the science on one side and the ability to manipulate molecules and change molecules and um, alter the properties, the medical properties of molecules. That was all part of the study of opium and opiates. And um, then the development of synthetics, the opioids that we deal with now, like fentanyl and so on, um, all came out of this uh, search for better and better painkillers and ideally painkillers that were non-addictive. There's your partner behind you. And um, the... Uh, <laughs> And the and uh, so on one side you've got this this uh, these advances in science that are focused on on the molecules involved, and on the other side you've got the uh, social questions that came with the increasing strength and availability of opiates and opioids. Um, you've got the problems of addiction and overdose that we're dealing with today as well. Right. So I track the parallel uh, process of the development of the drugs and the development of the social issues around the drugs, the war on drugs, the whole question of um, how we deal with addiction and uh, overdose and so on. So I touch on some of those issues as well. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and just along the way, as you peppered it with things like I had no idea that alchemy came from, you know, the Egyptian science, the, the idea that the Egyptians were the, you know, those people who were able to, to, to break apart and distill and crystallize some of the original, um, you know, I, th I think you said, you know, yes. who, who were the who were the first people to figure out that the only one strain of poppy in particular was the one that was uh, was pleasurable. Um, and then as you get into the heroin one and yeah. the kind of idea of, you know, that you watch companies that we take as familiar names like Bayer and the origin of, 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 of groups like that and the creation of heroin as a brand name and, and so forth. Um, and it was, it was, it was, it was I'm just looking at this, this quote here about this sort of wonderful thing about, you know, $1.50 would buy you a, uh, uh, from Sears Roebuck, would, buy, would receive a syringe, two needles and two vials of Bayer heroin and a handsome carrying case. You know, that, that, as you say, that kind of intermingling of history and, uh, um, and productivity was remarkable. Um, I will, in, in regard to the Sears Roebuck thing, I thought that was, that was a nice bit too. That you could order a syringe and a uh, and a vial of heroin through through the mail. Um, that came from a period of time around 1900 when Americans, in particular, 
but actually globally, you could get opiates over the counter everywhere. You could get um, opium, raw opium over the counter in the grocery stores in England in the 1700s. You could get uh, morphine over the counter in American drug stores, you know, up until about 1920. And so the, well, 1912. So, so the um, part of what Americans are used to, you know, I was talking about this deal with uh, hydroxychloroquine and this fervent belief that this drug will somehow do something and we should have access to it. Um, and the, and the, uh, there's a big kickback against any government agency trying to restrict access to hydroxychloroquine, even though we need to restrict access to make sure that there are, uh, that the drug is available for its legitimate uses with malaria and lupus and so on. So um, this American strain of thought that we should have access to whatever drugs we want whenever we want them, that's rooted in a lot of American history. And it didn't really start, we, we didn't get used to the idea of prescription only drugs until very recently in the last century. Uh, prior to that, we had access to everything we wanted to buy. And that's what we, what we sort of thought of that as a right. You know, it was like, we can decide what medicines to take and we can go out and buy them ourselves and we don't need a third party to tell us. Um, now that's all been stood on its head in the last century. The reason that it's been stood on its head is because of uh, the modern uh, agencies like the Food and Drug Administration in the United States that lay down rules about safety and efficacy for drugs and then regulate their uh, dispersal. So today, if you wanna get a drug, you don't go down to the drugstore and get whatever you want, you get a prescription from your doctor. So the practice of medicine changed in response to the development of drugs to a certain degree. So what we think of as modern medicine is so tied into the development of drugs, those two uh, forces, those two processes parallel each other very strongly in one way, is in the power of the prescription pad and the way that doctors hold that power um, and now restrict people's access to drugs. And yet you still see that, that old feeling, you know, you see it with uh, hydroxychloroquine, you see that old American feeling of, I sh if I think this drug is gonna do something for me, I don't want anybody to tell me that it will or not, I'll decide for myself and I want access to it. That's still part of the, part of the show. Yeah, and, and and that comes through as well. I think that this idea of what I'm going to say American exceptionalism in the in, in access to, as you say, you know, you know the, the the statistics on how much of the world's opiates, you know, the U.S. consumes, you know, and you, and you say you know, there's an idea almost that Americans should feel no pain uh, in 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 their lives. Um, so you know, so access access to medicine is a is a very interesting uh, you know political question. Yeah. Yeah, um, and and there was and, and also some of the statistics that you drew out. I had no idea that the rates of uh, opiate addiction in 1900 was about the same as it was a hundred years later in 1990 in the 1990s. You know, so th those parallels were. were we don't. Yeah, yeah. The numbers. It is true that, that you know anecdotally uh, they didn't have um, good systems for getting the numbers together at that period of time, but from everything that I could see, from the numbers that were gathered, absolutely. It was because of morphine, morphineism, you know, the addiction to morphine prior to heroin was a huge issue. And, and it was uh, widespread in all classes of society. It was, it was um, an enormous health problem, and yet it was viewed very differently back then. It was not criminalized um, before 1900. It was not criminalized the way it's been criminalized now. So now we think of heroin addicts or junkies or you know um, people who are on the streets committing crimes because of these drugs. In the old days, with morphine, it's very actually quite a similar drug. Morphine uh, was considered to be a sort of a, a ladies' drug to a great degree. It was used by widespread in three groups. One were war veterans who were suffering from war wounds and had developed an addiction. Uh, one were uh, physicians and people in the healthcare industry who were often addicted. There were very high levels of morphine addiction among doctors. And the third group were um, sort of genteel ladies who uh, could easily get morphine, who might have been given morphine to ease uh, 
um, some pains having to do with childbirth or, or some other um, problem relatively early in life and developed an addiction. And they very quietly kept up their addiction. They had a syringe in their bedroom and they would very quietly uh, retire for the evening and, uh, and give themselves a dose of morphine. That was quite common. So it's a different, it was a different kind of addiction problem, but it was a widespread addiction problem. Yeah. yeah. No, and very interesting. And then probably the other parallel that I think was interesting, I mean, you know, you, the anti-vaxxers of today and the people who have a view about vaccinations and, uh, um, you know, herd immunity. So words that we're using, you know, today politically, um, the chapter on, you know, Lady Mary Montague and the, and the, and the kind of the, the, the discovery of vaccination, inoculation, smallpox, cowpox, and so forth. Could you, you know, tell us tell us a bit more about that? Because that, you know, again was this fascinating historical story of, you know, uh, where you've got, you know, believing women, you know, believing, you know, whether a, a, a Turkish Muslim uh, sort of uh, idea could uh, could actually work in the um, in, in the Western world and so forth. So I'd love to hear it in your words. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, the, uh, I wrote a chapter about the development of, of smallpox inoculation. Uh, you know, having studied immunology as, as every physician and anybody who studies the history of science or medicine uh, gets the story of Edward Jenner. We all think of Edward Jenner as being the father of smallpox, uh, vaccination and in fact he he was he developed a vaccine for smallpox before jenner though there was a british noblewoman a very interesting woman very uh, literate well-read very brave woman who traveled with her husband to turkey in the 1700s very early 1700s uh, while jenner was still a boy she was traveling to turkey with her husband who was the ambassador to the ottoman empire uh, this lady, Mary Montague, um, was her name. And uh, while she was in Turkey, she observed the culture. Uh, she began to make friends with women who were high class, very um, sort of in the nobility of the Ottoman Empire at the time. She was invited to their homes and she uh, was entertained um, and was brought into this world of, of Muslim women that had never really been seen by a Western woman before. Um, so it was, a, it was a great adventure for Mary Montague. But while she was there, she noticed that unlike uh, most of the women in Europe who were scarred by smallpox, smallpox was a terrible, terrible disease. It was it killed more people than the Black Plague. It, uh, you know, the, these, um, horrible epidemics would sweep across Europe every year and uh, carry away tens of thousands of people. And the people who weren't uh, killed by the disease often carried deep scars. Their faces were right. um, yeah. damaged, their skin was damaged. They would have pits in their skin. Their eyes were often inflamed for the rest of their life. It was a disfiguring disease. So Mary Montague is in Turkey. She sees these Turkish women in their baths. She's in the baths with a Turkish woman. Their skin is beautiful. It's unmarked. There's no pox. And so she talks to them about this. And from the Turkish women, she gets the story of these um, traditions they have for uh, giving children a small dose of smallpox when they're young in order to give them a mild form of the disease that is non-scarring. And then when they get older, they never get the disease. This was news to almost everyone in the West. But Mary Montague brought the technique back with her to England from Turkey. She actually dared to use it on her own son um, over the objections of her physician. She, she actually ex used her son. She didn't want her son to die from smallpox. She had him inoculated, then she had her daughter inoculated. And then she, um, back in England, she knew the royal family and she convinced uh, members of the royal family to back the idea of inoculation. Before you know it, people were using this Turkish technique. And uh, 
so she was she was really responsible. This is a woman who had no training in medicine, but she was just very smart, very um, fearless, I guess. So she she made this uh, uh, big uh, cause of her day. This is well before Jenner. That what they were doing was called inoculation. It wasn't vaccination. Inoculation is when you're using a mild form of the of the disease itself. So they were actually inoculating people with smallpox, which was occasionally deadly. Jenner uh, moved the process forward by discovering and sort of proving that cowpox could do the same thing. So he that's vaccination from back up a cow. So uh, Jenner got us to vaccination. Mary Montague started the ball rolling, though very few people knew her story. She's a fascinating woman. So I uh, brought that out. It's an example of how people who are untrained in the medical sciences can make tremendous medical advances. Um, and I found her very interesting. Yeah, and, and that observation uh, was, uh, was, was very pertinent that um, this kind of this, this serendipity, you know, based approach. Um, and also that idea that, you know, sometimes the people who get famous are not the people who, um, who uh, were the inventors, if you like, of the idea, but the people that brought it to the world uh, uh, later on and the people whose names we, uh, we, 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 we get to know. Um, and then the one that was, um, uh, you know, as you start to get into the, you know, the idea of the, the, the first synthetic drug, uh, you know, really developed, um, which I'm, I'm gonna say feels like this, almost the start of the, uh, the modern day pharmaceutical company, you know, is something developed in a test tube that uh, that goes on to, uh, uh, to, to, to to be useful. Can you tell us a bit more about the kind of um, the, 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 the sulfur chapter? Sure, sure. Um, I do want to mention chloral hydrate before we go to sulfur. Though. Chloral hydrate sure. was uh, an early uh, kind of knockout drug. Um, and uh, it was it was a, it was a synthetic drug. It was a Chloral hydrate was interesting because um, it showed the world that you could have a medicine that wasn't produced in the body itself, that the medicine could be uh, synthetic and it could um, have an effect on human beings. So, so chloral was important, but uh, sulfa was even more important. Sulfa drugs were developed by the Bayer Company as part of an industrial research program. So sulfa, um, came in the wake of uh, Salversan. Salversan was an anti-syphilitic drug that Paul Ehrlich had developed in as sort of a one-off drug. Um, and Salversan was, became very famous. It was a, 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 a demonstrated that a scientist in a laboratory could actually have an effective drug. Salversan wasn't a very good drug, but it, was, it could actually work. Um, so Ehrlich opened the door, then Bayer started this industrial program to follow up on what Ehrlich had done and um, built this whole department for the discovery of uh, drugs to fight bacterial infections primarily, although they were also studying tropical diseases and parasitic diseases. So they started this industrial system for discovering drugs. Um, Bayer was in the business of making fabric dyes. So they were creating hundreds of new synthetic chemicals uh, to use as dyes. And, and uh, they thought that there was a chance that a dye molecule might have biological activity because, uh, you know, when you use dyes to stain a bit of tissue, um, you can get selective dyes to stain different tissues different ways. Some dyes, for instance, will pick out nerve cells within a, an amount of tissue. So you can see the nerve cells better. Some dyes will pick out bacteria and you can see the bacteria. The thinking was if the dye can specifically attach to a bacteria somehow, maybe we can attach, a guide, you make it into a guided missile. We can attach a poison to that dye. The dye will attach to the bacteria and we can poison the bacteria with, by using the dye. So they had this whole theory about why dyes might make medicines. They produced all these synthetic dye molecules. They sent them over to a laboratory they sent up under the direction of a physician whose name was Domak. Domak was a guy who was very committed to finding a cure for bacterial diseases because 
he had been a physician in World War I and had seen thousands of men die of wound infections. He wanted to stop infections. He thought dyes were a way to do it. So he began testing all of these dye molecules in this industrial setting in Bayer. And he came up with, after years of finding nothing, after years of zero, he came up with, finally, a, a group of drugs that actually could stop basically streptococcal infections, but then they were developed to stop other infections. This was the first real antibiotic uh, with widespread antibacterial activity. And it was based on a dye molecule, they thought. Right. It turned out that the dye didn't have anything to do with it. It was a little side chain they put on the dye that was the actual active molecule. That was called sulfa. This little side molecule had been an industrial chemical for decades, had been sitting on shelves in, in uh, warehouses by the canful, and it turned out to be a miracle drug. So they discovered sulfa. Sulfa was attached to all kinds of other things and created a huge phenomenon in the years just before World War II. Uh, during World War II, then uh, based on sulfa's success, people developed penicillin, which had been discovered earlier, but set aside. Um, penicillin took over and sulfa you hardly ever hear about. It's still around, but it was the first antibiotic. It was an enormous advance, not only because it was the first antibiotic, uh, widely defined antibiotic. It was the first one, but also because it showed that you could have an industrial setting for drug discovery. You could start a process in which you're testing, you know, many, many, many new molecules against specific diseases. You could develop systems for doing that, and you could do it quickly, um, relatively quickly. That set up the model for the modern pharma industry really yeah no and it's interesting and that that chapter almost branches into a few different places i had no idea that uh you know, fdr jr was the uh the kind of first person to receive an antibiotic in the in, in the united states um so that, that must have been yeah, a hell of an experiment to try yeah 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 um and also you talk about the kind of almost the creation of the fda as a response from the kind of from the the, the poisoning um that, that really followed yes. that, 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 that down. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, you know, anytime there's a new drug, um, I mentioned in the book, a thing called the Saiga cycle. The Saiga cycle is uh, a, a three-step um, process that almost every new wonder drug goes through. The Saiga cycle happens over and over and over again. And it goes like this. A new drug is discovered, you know, like the sulfa drugs. And at the moment of discovery, the drug company starts touting the product. Uh, the news coverage is wonderful. This is a new wonder drug. It does all this wonderful stuff. And the first step of the Saiga cycle is this honeymoon period for the drug in which everything is positive. The drug sales go through the roof and everybody's happy. Then you get to the second stage of the Saiga cycle which is when the reaction kicks in. The second stage happens when the side effects of the drug, every drug has side effects, of course, when the side effects become evident and people realize it's not the wonder drug they thought it was. And suddenly there are all these terrible stories about um, the drug causing problems or being overused or being used wrongly. Um, and the honeymoon is over. And everybody suddenly thinks that the drug is the, is the worst thing ever. And that's the second stage of the Saiga cycle. Then finally, the third stage is people balance the honeymoon period and the, and the negative period, and they find out uh, what the drug's true properties are, you know, what, its, what its real therapeutic value is. And it becomes a part of the, of the regular canon of, the, of sort of the range of drugs that are available on a realistic basis. So the third stage is this, is this realism about what it actually does and what its side effects are. And it evens out. So one, two, three, the honeymoon period, the horrible reaction against that, then it evens out. With the sulfa drugs, stage two happened when a bunch of kids began to die in Tulsa, Oklahoma, in the United States. Um, the kids were dying from a, a contamination of a sulfa drug. 
that had been developed for children's use uh, primarily. It was a sweet uh, tasting liquid form of sulfa that everybody thought sulfa drugs would cure everything you could, you could get. So if your kid came down with something, the doctor might prescribe this, uh, or, or the drug might, uh, druggist might sell, a little sweet uh, ampule of a sweet liquid that a kid wouldn't mind taking that had sulfa drugs in it. Well, this one preparation was made with a poisonous solvent. It was made with diethylene glycol, which is an antifreeze, it's a poison. And the kids were taking the sulfa drugs and they were dying from the solvent in the drug um, in this one preparation. The reaction was so intense. It was like the biggest mass poisoning in US history up to that point. And it created headlines across the United States. The government got involved and the government um, used the early, sort of the early form of the Food and Drug Administration. This is in the 1930s. Food and Drug Administration wasn't anything big at the time. There wasn't a big uh, uh, bureaucracy there. There weren't many agents, but this poisoning was so dramatic, so tragic, all these kids dying, that they ramped up the FDA, they changed the food, uh, or they changed the drug regulations in the country to emphasize safety as well as efficacy and, to, and advertising as well. And to try and stop this from ever happening again, it really created modern drug regulations. And that was all a reaction to one company making a bad preparation, a bad batch of a medicine yeah yeah no it's fascinating and, and you know on an earlier episode of the podcast i talked with uh, Catherine eban about the uh um you know the current status of uh, of really the generics industry and, uh, and where we're getting a lot of our generics drugs from and it's not quite poisoning but certainly the fda has lost its um some of its teeth about the you know guaranteeing the quality of medicines for uh for, for, for americans so Another couple of interesting chapters are, um, you know, the the, the development of, a, of the contraceptive pill um, and its effect on essentially liberating women in in many ways, and also the um, the, the kind of you know the male erectile dysfunction uh, pill. You know, I, I'd love your perspective on on those two chapters too. Sure, sure. That, that section I call "Sex, Drugs, and More Drugs," and uh, it's it is. Uh, the thing that, that interested me, I, I first went into it because of uh, the development of Viagra, which was a huge blockbuster bestseller uh, drug that doesn't really uh, cure anything. It is a, a, uh, it's a drug that is a temporary fix for a symptom of erectile dysfunction. I mean, it, it will solve erectile dysfunction uh, problems for men, but it does it temporarily. You have to keep taking it if you want the effect to continue. Basically, if you want Viagra to work for you your whole life, you have to take it for your whole life. Uh, it's, not, it's not like an antibiotic where you take it for a short period of time and it cures the underlying problem. Viagra doesn't cure the underlying problem of erectile dysfunction, but it does provide symptomatic relief. And that movement in the drug industry interested me Viagra, you know, this, this sort of move from a cure for an underlying condition to a symptomatic relief and a sort of a chronic, uh, uh, um, a drug that you would take for life, essentially, uh, is, is an example of uh, what I see as a larger move in the pharmaceutical industry toward uh, classes of drugs that will tend to sell for longer periods of time. Uh, in any case, Viagra was fascinating because of its sudden success and the fact that it is, you know, it doesn't solve, uh, it doesn't really cure a life-threatening disease in any way, but it made a ton of money. Um, and it was a huge social phenomenon. Yeah. That got me interested in the contraceptive pill for women, um, which happened uh, just a decade or two earlier. And it had a similar social effect. Again, uh, the contraceptive pill for women didn't uh, cure any life-threatening problem. It was a lifestyle drug that all that gave people, it gave women the ability to control um, contraception that they hadn't had before. So they were able to take control over their reproductive life in ways that had tremendous social impact. 
so they could, for instance, young women, in, instead of uh, moving directly into an early marriage and childbearing, had the ability to delay childbearing and go to graduate school, get graduate degrees. Um, and there are a whole bunch of sociological studies that show the effect of the drug on altering um, kind of the earning potential and the career potential of women, um, in addition to all of the other uh, sort of male-female interaction changes that happened along with the pill. Both of these groups of drugs, uh, Viagra and contraceptive pills for women, um, really did change people's habits. You know, ch they changed the social interactions of uh, human beings on a vast scale, on a global scale and are still doing so now. Um, and that is a world uh, of drug effects that people don't think about as much. It's the way in which they can alter not only our medical lives um, in a very narrow sense, but also our social lives in the ways in which we operate within society. Drugs can have a profound, uh, make a profound change that way as well. Plus, there are lots of funny stories about those drugs. The development. Yeah. Of the drug. I, I was I was delighted to see the uh, the story of Giles Brindley in there, and I think uh, I, I worked with a guy who'd been in the room when Giles Brindley did his uh, very famous uh, presentation at the uh, oh, really? AUA. Yeah, and uh, and but you've you've given it a lot more uh, a lot more depth than he uh, he he ever gave to me. Um, that was uh, so. Yeah, I think I'd encourage people to read that in the book um, for sure. A um, classic moment in medical history. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes, um, uh, never to be repeated, I suspect. Um, but then, yeah. But maybe loop back to the piece about you know, antipsychotics, and you talk about this kind of golden era of uh, golden age of, uh, of, of, of breakthroughs. Um, the, uh, the 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 kind of creation of Thorazine almost by accident, and then the application of Thorazine to the to the kind of world uh, that, uh, that, that that some people knew about, but really most people didn't, um, was was also very interesting. Um, could you elaborate a little bit on the kind of antipsychotics, the the effect on asylums and and psychiatry? I think I think the antipsychotics um, were what brought me into this whole book actually this the the earliest work that i did on on the history of drug development i did i did a book on sulfa drugs a while ago but i also got interested very interested in mind drugs so, you know um mind drugs defined uh in the pharmaceutical sense as drugs that have an uh are designed to have an effect on um mental disease and and uh to ease mental afflictions specifically psychological problems um, these drugs did not exist before the 1950s in any significant way. They, we had sleeping pills, you know, there were uh, hypnotics and sedatives um, to calm people down if they were agitated. But beyond that, we didn't have anything specific uh, to deal with um, mental issues. Then in the 1950s, all of a sudden, these drugs began appearing, uh, three huge classes of drugs within a short period of time in the 1950s. Um, all, they, they all showed up, and I'm fascinated with why it happened right then. Uh, the three classes of drugs were antipsychotics, and, uh, antidepressants, and uh, minor tranquilizers. All showed up within about a 10-year period. Um, and the reason has to do with a conjunction of sort of uh, the right time socially. This is post-World War II. A lot of people were suffering from a lot of uh, uh, stress. Uh, there was you know, there, there was a lot of social social angst at that time in the 1950s as people were trying to rebuild normal lives after World War II. Um, so there was that, uh, you know, level of anxiety that was rising a little bit, the Cold War stuff. Um, and that created a market for tranquilizers. Uh, and at the same time, there was a, uh, a an understanding that drugs to to deal with mental issues were actually worked, that there were drugs that could actually work to do it. There was nothing, a lot of people thought prior to the 1950s that the only answer for mental problems, uh, for significant mental problems was psychoanalysis, you know, talk therapy, Freudian therapy was uh, all the rage in the United States and to a certain extent in 
Europe as well. And in the 50s, that all changed because we found these classes of drugs that could be used to open the door um, if, if, to treating a number of mental conditions, including um, conditions that people thought would never be cured, uh, like schizophrenia. Now, schizophrenia is still not curable, but antipsychotics opened up the door to getting schizophrenic people, people who are seriously mentally ill. It opened the door um, to allowing them to be treated in other ways. So uh, the, and the advent of the antipsychotics was fascinating. As you said, it, they came out of left field. They weren't being looked for originally. Um, the, uh, the drugs were discovered accidentally, more or less, by a French physician who was trying to find a, uh, he was trying to fix the problem of surgical shock. Surgical shock, when people go into shock on the operating table, was this guy's, uh, that was his goal. He wanted to solve the problem of surgical shock. I was a surgeon. And uh, he was looking for all these ways to uh, decrease surgical shock. He was developing cocktails of drugs to try and calm patients down uh, prior to surgery so that they wouldn't go into shock. And one of the drugs that he, that he came across was an antihistamine, an antihistamine that he added to his cocktail because I, if you've ever taken an antihistamine, you might know the old, old antihistamines made you drowsy. If you took an antihistamine, you tended to get sleepy. Well, he wanted some of that in his cocktail. He found an antihistamine that turned out to be the first antipsychotic. It was Thorazine. Um, and I tell the story of the development of Thorazine out of that. But it's another way. These stories repeat over and over in the history of drug development. People are looking for one thing, but they keep their eyes open and they'll notice something else. And that something else will turn out to be more important. The same thing happened with minor tranquilizers. I didn't really tell this story in the book uh, to any extent, but the first, you know, the, the, when I say minor tranquilizer, I'm talking about drugs like uh, Xanax and, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Valium, you know, yeah. the, the uh, benzodiazepines. They, the first minor tranquilizer was discovered by accident by a researcher who was looking for a penicillin um, additive that would keep penicillin from spoiling. He was looking for uh, something he could wow. add to penicillin to keep it fresh. And wow. he found that one of the compounds he was looking at, he was testing them for uh, toxicity in animals. He found that one of these compounds that he was looking at made his test mice relax. And it was just a completely accidental um, observation. He might've ignored it. Yeah. Had he ignored it, we never would have found minor tranquilizers, but he looked at what the compound was doing to rats. He yeah. found a drug called Miltown, which was a phenomenal you know, success in the 50s. Yeah. Uh, Mar they called it a martini and a pill. So anyway, yeah. um, the, uh, the mind drugs all came out of this kind of accidental discovery. Antidepressants were discovered by accident when some patients started dancing in a mental hospital and so on. Um, the, uh, it opened up the door to a new understanding of mental processes as chemical processes rather than electrical processes in the brain. Uh, the emphasis is now on neurotransmitters and finding new classes of drugs based on neurotransmitter manipulation and, and uh, drugs that affect that. So that's opened up enormous new fields. Antipsychotics were the best-selling drugs um, around the year 2000. Antidepressants were the best-selling drugs in the 1990s. And I, or, uh, minor tranquilizers were best-selling drugs in the 60s. These drugs are huge. And they just, they all came out of nowhere. Yeah. No, and I think it was interesting because you said as, as the industry sort of moved into what it would regard as a more rational approach to d design and, uh, and, and, and development, they've also had a bigger problem in R&D. So I think this, this belief in rational has probably been a, a, a bit of a struggle. Um, and I know we won't get time to, yeah. to, do the, to do justice to the rest of the book, but uh, you know, one line struck me in the, in the monoclonal antibody uh, chapter, which was about, uh, it was something I didn't know that after the, um, really the discovery in the UK uh, of, um, of 
monoclonal antibodies that a letter from the British government said it's certainly difficult for us to identify any immediate practical applications which could be pursued as a commercial venture you know what a <laughs> that's one of those letters that really the industry should hold up as uh, as proof of uh, that, that no one yeah. knows anything um, so um, uh, you know, I think I think in summary, I'm hoping that you've got another ten drugs identified as a as a follow up to this because it, it definitely had that, you know, absolute readability and the and the historical context was uh, was, uh, was was wonderful. If um, if people want to find out more about you, Thomas, what's the what's the best way to uh, to, to to kind of find you on on the internet? Well, uh, my homepage is thomashager.net. Um, so just my name, all one word, thomashager.net. And you can find out more there. I'm on, you know, the, my books are on Amazon. They're all over the place. Just if you look for the title of any of the books, you'll find me as well. That's phenomenal. Well, well thank, you, thank you so much for taking the time out to talk about this. I, I could have listened to you for another couple of hours telling the stories. It's, uh, you, you, oh, you Mike, uh, thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. No, you absolutely are a storyteller. Thank you, Thomas. That was that was great. Um, thank you again. Um, I uh, I'll, I'll, I'll clip out the relevant bits. Would you like to see it before it goes live on, on the podcast? You know, I don't I don't think I need to see it before it goes live. But when it does go live, send me out a notice. I would Absolutely. I would like to uh, take a look. At it. And who's who is your audience primarily, Mike? So pharmaceutical uh, uh, folks. Um, so I, I'm. I, I guess my profile is generally I'm, I'm, a, I'm a protagonist for industry innovation, uh, but that also leads to being an antagonist of some of the industry's practices sometimes. Um, so mm. there's a there's a there's about 300 250 people uh, listen you know download the podcast. Uh, the videos get out to another couple of hundred. Good. Um, so you know the, I hope that we'll introduce some so some some people to the books. I, I, will, I would like pharma folks to read more in general about step rather than just going in and putting their heads down and uh, and doing the next thing they're told to do so. yeah yeah it's a constant discussion that i have on um, uh, the difficulty you know it's 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 a such a problem this history of science thing is i i find it astounding that so many researchers in the field don't know how research was done the antecedents for their research yeah. i think that it would be valuable as it was for me would be valuable for more people to know more about but that's just my prejudice so. yeah well, anyway uh, thank my, you my, thank too. you for looking me up i appreciate it no i very much appreciate it. thank you so much yeah. enjoy your weekend yeah you too mike thanks Tom.